This is World Awakenings, the fast track to enlightenment with your host, Carl Gruber. World Awakenings is a podcast dedicated to opening your mind, your heart, and your eyes to the fact that the world's population is now, more than ever, awakening to all things spiritual, metaphysical, and enlightening, and just how they play an all-important role in our daily life. So join Carl on this enlightening experience as he interviews metaphysical and spiritual experts to discuss, debate, and delve deeply into the hows and whys of this worldwide awakening. The law of attraction states that everything is energy and that like attracts like. True spirituality states that the only true reality is that of oneness, unity, and unconditional love and forgiveness. Together, these two are attached at the hip and perform a beautiful symbiotic dance together. Hi, I'm Carl Gruber, author of the brand new book, True Spirituality and the Law of Attraction, a Beautiful Symbiotic Relationship. This is a book that will show you how to build a rock-solid personal foundation based on unchanging, eternal, universal truth that shows you how to become a consistent co-creator with the universe to create the life you love to live and live to love. Get your copy today of my new book, True Spirituality and the Law of Attraction, A Beautiful Symbiotic Relationship, and learn how to manifest the life you truly desire to be living. Now available as an ebook or paperback on Amazon. Hard to believe that when I started the show, World Awakenings, a fast track to enlightenment, back in June 2018, that I would be here 153 episodes later, and I love it. I'm so grateful that you can join us for today's show, and thank you. I'm your host, Carl Gruber. Now, on to meet this show's featured guest. Our guest is Cassandra D. Ann. After growing up in a dysfunctional home, she was able to address the trauma that occurred growing up in a religiously abusive home. She was then able to rebuild her confidence and go on to be a successful entrepreneur. Then after a spontaneous awakening and a journey of transformation and self-discovery, she now follows her heart's desires to inspire and uplift others, which I love that part. She is a certified human design reader, certified galactic astrologer, Akashic record soul reader, and Gene Keys guide. Wow, lots of great stuff. Cassandra helps guide others to break away from societal programming and reconnect with their true essence. Now she shares her story in hopes of empowering others to live unapologetically as who they were designed to be, which is very cool. Cassandra, thank you for being on World Awakenings. Oh, thank you so much, Carl, for having me. I'm really excited to talk with you today. Well, this is great. I, you know, I, I'm going to have to wear sunglasses just to look at your brilliant red <laughs> hair. It's awesome. It's gorgeous. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Where's my sunglasses? But, <laughs> but anyway, you know, you what I've seen, you have many awesome talents as a light worker, but the beginning of your life wasn't so fun from what we hear. Tell us about how you grew up, uh, what you grew up in, and as you describe it, an abusive religious household. Yeah. Oh, goodness gracious. Uh, there's much that could be said, but generally speaking, I grew up in a fundamentalist evangel- ev- and yeah evangelical uh, family, which was... Hmm, already challenging as it is if you are familiar with fundamentalist beliefs basically it's the bible is taking very quite literally um we were very sheltered from who we were allowed to speak to you know television was out the even the christian music that i listened to my mother would you know keep a track on how many times they said jesus and you know there were very strict standards um that we grew up on where i coin it as abusive is it was quite a dysfunctional home. Um, 
after my studies later down the road, my parents very much fall under the category of like a narcissistic behavior. So religion was used as a tool for manipulation. Um, there were many circumstances in which religion was used for their advantages, such as, um, you know, part of that narcissistic quality is needing to be the center of everything. Therefore, both myself, my brother, and even my father um, experienced circumstances in which my mother would say, oh, the Lord told me you, they're not the right people for you. This is not a holy relationship. There was constant dialogue that kept me contained within this very strict confined environment even within the church when church was out it was expected that my brother and i would be right there by their side ready to go if they saw us talking to anybody or engaging with anybody we got the third degree there was a tight rope on trying to keep us from speaking to anyone outside and you know because what we saw at home was totally different than what everybody outside had seen so my mother was big on the devil conversations of the devil possession my brother and i grew up with people being delivered by demons in the house crawling on the floor screaming while we're trying to sleep at night and ultimately my mother went on to feel that there was no church that was good enough um, and become a, became an apostle herself. And, uh, you know, ultimately at 18, my grandfather, who was a Christian, raised Methodist, went to church every Sunday, Wednesday, he committed suicide in which my mother said that the Lord showed her it was because he was not on fire for God enough and committed enough to his purpose. So the Lord allowed the devil to take his life. And that was sort of the last straw. I moved out at 18 and decided to attempt life on my own, despite having no adulting skills whatsoever from being so sheltered. Um, I fumbled my way through until ultimately my awakening. <laughs> Wow, holy mackerel, that is, you know, I grew up in a household, a uh, uh, completely agnostic household where God wasn't even brought up or anything, and if we brought up the name God, it was just kind of glossed over, and so, wow, so it was mainly your mother who was the, the, the very um, uh, uh, adamant <laughs> evangelical uh, type of uh, religious person. Yeah, I would definitely say yes to that. Um, my my father to this day kind of has the perspective of just trying to keep the peace a little bit with my mother. Um, ultimately, though, I've been disowned by my parents, um, and we are no longer in contact. So okay, so um, what did growing up in this type of environment as a youngster do for you uh, to your development as a person at that time oh gosh yes so much um you know i think that the there are challenges around the concept of religion as it is feeling that we innately at birth are unworthy our sinners are bad um, so there's always that language that's challenging, but it especially made me feel worthless. Also, not only that, but in that sort of environment, you're trained and groomed to, you know, if you're a good person, you know, it, because you want to be good, because you don't want to burn in the fiery pits of hell, you know, um, you obey your mother and father and you obey all of the authorities that are above you. If there was very much this feeling of, I felt completely disconnected from any sense of personal authority or intuition that I would have because you know it's you're 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 just 
you know, it's that worthless sense of only through the grace of God, everything. And so it makes you feel like you can't question things. It is the hardest thing to come out of because the way it messes with your mind, you feel frightened to entertain anything outside of it. So ultimately, my I, I when I moved out at 18, I ended up marrying. We almost got a divorce. We went to talk therapy. And through that, that was the first time I had someone bring light to the dysfunction I grew up on. But even at that, it was a Christian counselor. And that made me feel comfortable because, you know, the devil couldn't use a secular counselor to brainwash me. So it was, it's just so challenging um, to come out of those narratives. I fell into terrible traps of seeking out external validation. And ultimately it, it caused challenges in my work and my relationships and my everything, just having that insecurity and lack of self. So when you were a child growing up in this environment, did you go to public school? I did. I did actually. That's a question I've, been asked before, because I know that is pretty stereotypical um, for people to be homeschooled. And my brother, who's five years younger, he was, he ended up being homeschooled. Um, but I was the first child and they allowed me to go to high school. However, there was a lot of things I wasn't allowed participating, anything to do with sex ed, you know, I was raised in purity culture, you know, and all of that. So there were limitations, um, but I was allowed going to public school. Yeah, and I ask that because I would think, you know, being so sheltered uh, w within that, your home at that time, you had to have seen the other things of the world from, from your peers in classes, you know, in school. So that, that must have opened your mind a little bit. It's going, huh, <laughs> there's another way to live? <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, and I would like to think that it really, that I got that. However, I was really sucked into wanting to make my parents happy. Um, and just really, you know, they talk about fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. I was the fawner. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I've, I've said in things I've shared about my story before, it was almost in ways I felt like I was courting my parents than their child. I was very much um, made everything I could do to like do for them to make them happy because that's how they raised me, you know, to to cater to all of their needs and in ways that weren't healthy. Yeah. Wow, that is really interesting. You know, you know, and again, I mentioned, you know, my growing up too, you know, literally the antithesis of what you, <laughs> you had. And here we are both here talk about all these cool things. <clears throat> One other thing, you mentioned that people are programmed by society. So why does society try to do this to all of us? I mean, it seems like society is trying to tame a wild horse who yearns to be free. Oh, gosh, you know, there are so many rabbit holes I could go down with that, um, which should go back to my, you know, galactic passions. Um, but essentially, I think we can look at it as this. I think that, you know, humanity as a whole, we are a part of this evolutionary journey and we're meant to find our way through things, find our way to self, whether we're talking religion or politics, you know, uh, cultural beliefs, there are essentially always, you know, there's this I feel like I say always because I believe there is always going to be some sort of polarity um, in this journey, but there are, let's just say there are those who feel like they are stuck in that survival mindset, that mindset of this is mine, this is yours, who's in power, who has the authority. I mean, the religious patriarchy essence falls into that you know, category as well. And and as long as we feel like our 
essence of who we are is constantly weighed and measured through the external reflection of another, there's always going to be that energetic placeholder for someone to play that role. And so I think that, you know, uh, this journey, a lot of us are kind of wrapped up into what we would say that 3D reality is, you know, of what life is supposed to look like, what's responsible according to some external perspective. Yeah, you know, you you mentioned going down rabbit holes on that one. I mean, heck, uh, we're not going to go there, but I mean, conspiracy theorists think that, you know, society is programmed so that there can be control of a dark cabal. But then there's also, um, I'm a a student of A Course in Miracles, where it just says this is all an illusion. Yeah. so that's another rabbit hole we could do two or three shows on, huh? but, <laughs> but the, you know, I find this really interesting from what I read on, on your website about in your bio, um, you used to work in the wedding industry as an entrepreneur, but then you had a spontaneous awakening. What was this awakening and what triggered it? Well, that is really interesting because at the time, I didn't really know what was going on. But after I realized that there were, my awakening was during a significant solar eclipse that took place in my natal chart. And there's a lot of other uh, astrology language I could, you know, get into. But basically, there were, let's just say there were many cosmic factors. Um, Um, that were activating at that particular time. I'm told that my experience is a little unusual because normally there's like a death or something, you know, tragic that happens to kind of jumpstart something like that. But really there wasn't anything that dramatic that happened. I could say about a month prior, um, I received my first after 10 years in the wedding industry, my very first negative comment of something I created, which kind of caused me to spiral a little bit in the sense of, um, you know, because I, I worked for validation, everybody has to be happy. If they're not happy, you know, what something's wrong with me. And it was so silly and petty, but it did cause me to take that moment of what am I doing? How did I get here? Um, And I kind of just fumbled for a month trying to find my passion for my work again. And I had opened the door up this much and decided to go see a psychic. Um, And that just so happened to be the day before the eclipse. And that day was completely unusual. I wish I could be a fly on the wall to replay it. But basically, over the course of the day, things started to just unwind for me, like the veil was lifted. Um, I decided to kind of listen somebody, you know, I heard someone talk about astrology. And so I had never, ever, ever listened to a podcast. And I thought, you know what, it's a long drive, I'm going to pull up a podcast. And I found some podcasts to listen to. And it was two college age girls talking about astrology. And Most of it didn't relate to me, but it was just something happened where it was like, all of a sudden, by the time I got to the psychic reading, I was doing all of the talking, which was completely unusual. And I was just stating all of these factual things to her about my life and like, well, this is because of this and this is that. And it was just flowing out of me and it just continued on. And by that night, I felt like I had a complete understanding of my natal astrology chart. And I told my husband, I said, it's a recipe. It's all right here. How come I didn't know this sooner? And I had friends who mentioned these things to me before, but I never entertained them because that's of the devil. That was bad, you know? And so it just was like right time, right place. 
the next day I had someone who worked with me that, you know, a series of days in a row. So they saw me a couple of days before and they saw me that day after. And they said, Cassandra, you're not the same person. Your energy feels totally different. My husband, we were married almost 20 years, was like, who on earth are you? Um, and it was just like that, that I became this other person. Wow, that is that is an amazing story. So that you could change like that, and you know, all things in in divine timing. And yeah. so, but overall, this spontaneous awakening just changed your entire life. Where did you go from there? Did you quit the wedding business and just start being uh, in, getting into astrology and all these other things? Well, the proc the process was probably I would say just under a year of transitioning um i just continued on with my love for astrology and my curiosity because when something like that happens to you and especially i tend to be lean more towards logical explanation you know and it's like when something like that happens it's 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 unraveling you know trying to figure out so that it started off just like curiosity and the more I went into astrology the more I loved it um which ultimately led me to human design which um human design felt a little more easier to digest and some of the complexities of astrology so I kind of jumped over there for a while and um, ultimately within about a year, um, the universe made it very obvious to me that that stage of my life was over and that I was entering a new chapter and that was hard. It was hard to go from the, you know, recognizable title <laughs> of a wedding floral designer to <laughs> you know, okay, let's wait and see, you know, um, but the door was shut. And as a matter of fact, my whole awakening experience has felt very accelerated the whole process, almost like there's just been like we talked about a divine timing, you know, now is a time. Um, and it just kind of fell into place. And now here I am. Wow, so there's like the, the two lives of Cassandra, the first half and then the second half. So, wow, on that, well, now your goal is, I, I, for lack of a better term, I say you're a light worker who is there to help empower other people. Um, you know, you, you do all these cool things. You're a certified human design reader, certified galactic astrologer. You just kind of talked about that. Akashic Records soul reader. I've had a, a Akashic Records uh, person on here. Gene Key's guide. Is there any one of these uh, that, that you'd like to talk about? I think you mentioned human design. Yeah, yeah, sure. So now the reason I stumbled upon human design is because it is kind of intricately woven into astrology as well. It uses a lot of astrology. So there was someone I followed when I was learning about astrology that started talking about human design. And it was interesting because at first I was, I was like, uh, I don't know what that, you know, that is. And that was kind of my first lesson that if the universe wants you to pursue something, it's going to keep putting it in front of you. And so it kept coming up over and over and over. And finally, I decided to pull my human design chart up to kind of see what it was all about. And it's interesting because most people share when they first see their human design chart, it is very overwhelming. However, I just was like oh, in love. I wanted to know what it meant. And by the time I got to the reading I had booked to learn more, I had already learned everything that we would have discussed in the actual reading itself. And so I learned human design really quickly. And for those who are not familiar with what it is, a formal definition could be that it is a synthesis of a variety of different modalities. It uses, as I mentioned, astrology, the Hindu chakra system, the Kabbalah tree of life, um, the um, 
uh, in the uh, Chinese I Ching. And then it mixes it with some more modern science concepts like quantum physics and chemistry, circuitry, things like that. And it produces what is called a body graph. But the general definition I could say is that you know it's basically reads our light signature the essence of you know who we are it uses our birth information you know the time in which we were brought here birthed into this reality um and it's a very easy to digest way to kind of feel out where you are as it relates to your authentic expression. And it is helps to kind of decondition from those societal programming things we talked about because society says this is what it should look like. This is what we should behave like where human design says, no, no, we are all really unique. How we make decisions, how we operate, what we contribute, you know, our gifts, everything is completely unique to each individual. And so I loved it because coming from where I did in my conditioning of the religious upbringing I had, it was the first time I felt like I had permission to be me. It felt like all of those things that were repressed under me that just kind of came forward and it gave me this sense of self that is it, it, it's it's almost hard to put in words and so i became certified in human design to be able to share that gift with others wow this is so cool what what a great thing that you're doing uh, I could, I was just thinking, you know, upon that spontaneous awakening you had, uh, heaven was probably up there going, yeah, she woke, <laughs> away. She awoke from the, from the nightmare. But, uh, but so the human design thing too, though, people can come to you and have you, uh, work with them on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I also have where you can pull like a free chart on my website. And of course, on my podcast, I talk a lot about human design there as well. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. So, you know, just for a moment, going back to your personal experience growing up, I'm, I'm wondering now that you've grown spiritually and have empowered yourself, um, have you made peace with your religiously abusive childhood and with your family? I have. Um, now, when I say I have, I would, you know, say once again, I have been disowned um, from my family. And interestingly, that happened um, for the second time. Um, I've been disowned twice for the second time a year before my awakening. And through my ability to kind of connect to my inner self, past lives, also through readers, I've found deep reasonings of why um, things happen and actually why I was disowned twice because ultimately I feel like it was meant to happen. It was destined to happen um, and it's been about three years. We've had no contact, but I feel that we all, it, we all choose our soul chooses the experiences that we want to go through. And that can be hard because, you know, we come here and we forget. And it can be easy to get lost within the things that are happening to us. But I feel like life is not happening to rather for us. And these relationships, I feel like on a soul level, we agreed to go play this game and go down this path. And I feel like I would not be who I am today if it wasn't for the things that happened throughout my life. And I kind of love who I am now. And I feel like I have nothing but love and and uh, tenderness towards my family. I wish them well, but I've had to learn that I can't do the work for them. 
I can't do the things for them. They have to come to that place for themselves, just like I had to come to that place for myself. And so I believe that our relationships, even the most challenging, are sort of the perfect karmic ingredients to help us evolve and grow and go through the journeys our soul wanted to experience in this lifetime. Yeah, no wonder you um, study the Akashic records, but, but you know, everything you just said um, that, um, you know, you love yourself now and, and where you were, you know, that really, I think just talking to you and looking at you here on the screen, that comes through very genuinely with you. You seem to have a very bubbly, effervescent, beautiful energy. And and I think people feel that. I bet just even, you know, people you you talk to and, and speak to. Um, you know, I do have a question, I, and I think uh, many of our listeners might be interested in What do you have to say to a person who has had a similar abuse of childhood but refuse to let it go and forgive. Oh gosh, you know, this is how I look at it. And this is actually part of what I've written in my book too, is that you have to, one of the best things I've heard, it actually came through um, Abraham Hicks, which uh, yes, okay. Um, she said something in, once that just really resonated with me. And it was the ideal about caring about how you feel right now, right in this moment, caring about how you feel now. Okay, do I want to continue to feel like the unwanted child the rejected child. I'm not good enough. I don't want to feel that way. That feels icky, right? That doesn't make my day, you know, beam with excitement and possibility. It makes me feel icky. And I don't want to feel that way, you know? And so it's when things that are challenging happens to us, I find that we, you know, we have to understand that we can't control them. We can't do that work for them. All we can do is for ourselves, which means that unfortunately, when people hurt us or when challenging circumstances arrive, the best thing you can do in the moment is to self-reflect for yourself. And why do I feel this way? You know, what can I do to help avoid feeling this way again you know and there are different things we can go through to sort of understand ourselves better for me it was like i said looking at i love who i am now this happened for a reason i can't do the work for them i want to care about how i feel now i don't want to feel like the rejected child i don't want to feel like my days are being robbed from me by feeling this heaviness of rejection. I want to feel vibrant. I want to feel alive. I want to feel full of life. And therefore, I learned to start looking at things happening to bring me to this place. And it's hard because we can't spiritually bypass our feelings. You know, we don't want to do that. But also, there's a point when you have to care about how you feel now and and decide how you want to move forward. How can you shift your perspective? How can you, you know, detach a little bit from what their thing is? Because that's the other thing. I could sit there and say, well, if they only did this, if my parents would only be that, you know, why can't they see that they need to do this? All of that language is out of my control. I can't do any of that work. I can only consider myself and what I can do. So I would say to consider how you want to feel now in this moment. And for me, um, forgiveness is is big, big, big key, you know, and, and, and I'm talking about true forgiveness, you know, the way the world practices forgiveness, they say, I forgive you, but somewhere on some level, they still feel th that they were wronged, you know, that's mm -hmm. wrong. And that that feeling that that lower level a wrong feeling actually creates energy blocks in your, your, into your body and yeah. many people will become ill with diseases or issues or injuries or accidents simply because of that so when i say forgive i mean really let it go it's 
done. It's gone and as if it never even happened anymore. And, you know, in this 3D world, that that ain't easy. <laughs> but uh, yeah. you know what? It is possible. And, right. and I think that is something else. So I, I love that advice you have for people in, in similar situations. You know, I saw that you consider yourself a star seed. So what is a star seed and why do you consider yourself one? Yeah, um, I love that conversation. <laughs> um, so it's my personal belief that when we consider the go back, way back, consider the origins of all, you know, in the beginning, however we want to look at it. Um, I see this as there was the original source energy that had the powerful thought of, I wonder what it would be like to experience myself. And with that, the power of thought created this fragmentation of this original source energy into different expressions that ultimately played out or put together this polarity journey that that we all experience and I believe that this all happened way beyond the creation of earth itself therefore while I resonate as a term star seed I would also argue that I do believe we all are star seeds originating from that original fragmentation of source energy. So when that energy fragmented and things started to play out, there were early incarnations of different, you know, galactic species and races, such as words, you know, many of us have heard with terms like Palladians or the Syrians or Acturians, words along these lines. So a star seed, though, generally speaking, would be someone who resonates with being a soul that originated outside of this earth planet. Um, so for that, you could be related to, you name it, uh, galactic wise. And that these, the reason I feel these are important is because each of these star races have their own characteristics, aspects, and stories, especially like, for example, the Lyrans came very early on in the journey of polarity and evolution. And so when you talk about races such as the Lyrans or the Vagans, this is the expression of divine, you know, masculine feminine and where we started to see some of the first pol polarity challenges. And so there are those ca characteristics, such as with the Lyrans, um, you can think of that first original energy, that creative spark, that yang expression of pioneering and exploration, you know, and so individuals that have connections to Lyra, these are characteristics that are very much a part of who they are now. So a starseed is simply just someone that resonates with with their origins of their soul being outside of earth. Wow, that was the most ex excellent explanation of that I've ever heard. You you nail it. We went back to the source, we the beginning of the source of all that is and we splintered off into infinite, you know, uh, <laughs> individual identities and races and languages etc and of course the miracles calls that uh, um, a man fell into uh, the the son of god uh, fell into uh, a tiny mad idea and splintered <laughs> off into it so that that wow that was a great explanation thank you for that wow thanks <laughs> thank you well, we're talking to cassandra dn and she is an amazing uh uh kind of a renaissance woman, a woman of uh, all things uh, light and good. So it's awesome. Uh, and you know, the, just talking about your explanation right now, any viewers or listeners, I would go back and rewind and, and listen to what she just said. That is that is just great. Wow. So let's find out more. There's more to know about uh, Cassandra. You're known as uh, a galactic astrologer many people are talking about the recent and continuing gigantic solar flares on the sun how do these flares affect a collective humanity and also how does it affect us uh, affect us individually 
Mm, that's a good question. So, you know, I'm, I wouldn't call myself the expert on this topic, but this is my personal beliefs. Um, and that is, I do believe that the solar flares are contributing to the shift in the Earth's frequency. Um, when we look at like the Schumann residence, we can see how once upon a time it kind of was stable in one place. And now all of a sudden we have all of these experiences that are causing the vibration of the planet to rise. And there are many theories out there about this, um, you know, as far as when we look at new earth and changing dimensional planes and many theories on that. Um, and but basically, I believe that as we are collectively awakening, our vibration is shifting. So is Mother Gaia's and that this is a important time of evolution and shift and change and frequency. And with that, I think also comes dramatic contrast. I feel that also the more our vibration rises, the more contrast we're going to see or experience with those who are not at similar vibrational frequencies. Um, so, you know, I've heard that um, people share that you can have symptoms. I think I have one day when it was like I started having all of a sudden headaches and, and um, nausea disorientation. And I looked and it was a solar flare. Um, so like I said, I'm not as versed in that. But looking at it from my expression and what I've felt um, when I actually became learning about galactic astrology, when I'm doing galactic astrology, I'm connecting to soul records of often in very high um, vibrational beings. And at first, I like I talked about that contrast, um, that the frequency differences would cause some disorientation um, that I would experience. But as I evolved and done this work, my vibrational residence has remained at a higher place than what it was, which allows me to have those interactions without as much contrast. So we can look at it in the physical se sense of earth, light codes. You know, that's another term you'll often hear when people are talking about the solar flares, um, this being cosmic, um, you know, sharing of light codes that are helping us in this earth um, evolution to where we're meant to go and head down. Well, and it makes sense to me that um, the solar flares may affect uh, us because, you know, everything is energy, which mm -hmm. includes our bodies. Yeah. And a solar flare is beyond our imagination of its power. And it hits Earth. And that energy would affect uh, mankind in, in many ways. I know myself, oh, geez, uh, much of last month, I felt super lethargic, which is really weird for me because I'm super healthy. I go running every day. And I talked to a colleague of mine in Australia who does astrology too, and she, she said she was going through the same thing too. So yeah, there's a lot to it, a lot to it, and I appreciate that. But um, also, hey, you, you're a podcaster. You have a show <laughs> called Things I Talk About. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I like to talk. <laughs> so it seemed like a fitting title, things I talk about. And um, on my podcast, I talk a lot about astrology, human design, uh, galactic astrology, gene keys, a lot of the language we've talked about here. Um, I share my especially in earlier episodes, I share in greater detail my religious experience growing up and coming out of that. Um, but yeah, I talk about a lot of a lot of spiritual content, anything to ri raise awareness on self reflection, um, and authentic expression. 
Well, okay. Well, you know, definitely check it, check that out because it's called Things I Talk About. Uh, there's a couple podcasts out there. There's one called World Awakenings too, which is where we're at right now. Hey, you have a book too, a forthcoming book you're writing and will soon be publishing. It's called, <laughs> what a great title, Unavoidable and Totally Basic Shadows. What is it about and uh, when can we expect it to be published? Oh, goodness. So it's funny you mentioned that because I actually am about to complete my proposal to submit to be considered for publication for Hay House. Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, it's in the process of being manifested. So I, this is, I'll find out by May if, uh, if um, they are interested in picking up the book. If not, I'm, I'm going to go forward with self-publishing. So either way, um, hopefully by the end of the year, <laughs> you know, by within a few months, I'll definitely know one way or another. Um, but it's been a journey. It is a very raw and vulnerable share of my personal life story. Growing up in a religiously abusive home, there it, I share a lot of um, challenging life situations that I experienced and went through in greater detail. And it allows the reader to sort of firsthand witness the effects of my upbringing and how I handled life up until my spontaneous awakening. And then it shares my full awakening journey, which was deconstructing my faith, considering star seed topics and exploration of cosmic topics and you know, all of the things, um, dark night of the soul, you name it, it's the full awakening experience. Um, and talks a lot about shadow work, because ultimately, it is the reflection of what happened to me in life, how I ended up um, behaving, being as an individual, the self reflection, which we can call shadow work, um, and what came out on the other side of it so i'm excited yeah i would i'm excited to to read it when it does come out i mean heck your life is definitely a book and if hay house uh hay house picks it up that'd be very cool because that is the place to go if you're a publishing work like this so C cassandra it's been awesome talking to you can can you tell us what is the best way for people to connect with you and what's your website yeah, so my website is my name, Cassandra Deanne, D E A N N dot com. And probably the best way to connect with me would be check out my podcast and maybe visit my Instagram. Yeah, and I'll put all the links to all of that uh, in the show notes here for you so people will be able to access that too. And so, Cassandra Deanne, thank you. Thank you for being on World Awakenings. What a blast. You are so much fun. You bring so much light and, and, and love, and you got lots of, to offer the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> This has been another episode of World Awakenings, the fast track to enlightenment with host Carl Gruber, a certified law of attraction life coach. We welcome you to tune in to each and every episode of World Awakenings as we open your mind, your heart, and your eyes to the fact that the world's population is now, more than ever, awakening to the truth of all things spiritual, metaphysical, and enlightening, and just how much they play an all-important role in our moment-to-moment -moment daily life. Much love and light to you, my friend, and thank you for tuning in to World Awakenings. Mm -hmm.